Um, on this Father's Day weekend, and I don't know my brother Bruce alluded to it, but it certainly brings back great memories to uh, think about the impact that my dad has had in my life. And uh, I think, do we have a photo of him? There he is. There's, you recognize two of the three. That middle one's my dad, our dad. Of course, now I got the volume too hot up here, Randy. Oh, mic checks are fun. We didn't do one. Um, but anyway, there's my dad in the middle. What was that? Probably about six years ago. And uh, our dad went to be with the Lord um, back in April of 2020. But that man showed me how to be uh, what a Christian man was, what a, a, what a Christian father looks like, what a Christian husband looks like, uh, a pastor person. And I just owe so much to my dad. And um, I'm grateful for the legacy that he left me. And glad I got a big brother that I can spend Father's Day weekend with. And so it's an honor to be here. Can we just give all of the dads that impacted our life and that are here today a big hand of love and appreciation? Whew. It can be a great day. It can be a tough day. Um, but we're grateful all the same. If you brought your Bible, go ahead and grab it and turn to James chapter 1. Um, it's always a little bit of a mind game for me to decide what I'm going to preach when I come to Tucson. They got Bill and Carol and uh, Glenn and Amy over there. They listen to me every week. They're there. And I'm like, what are they, what are they thinking this time? So here's, here's how I decided this time. When I was here, what, um, about two months ago, I gave you James part one. So even though it's been like two months, you're going to get James part two. There he goes. So turn to James chapter one. You know, when I was a kid, um, late elementary years, middle school years, my next door neighbor was a few years older than me. He was super cool, super confident. He wanted to be in the special ops when he grew up. In fact, he became a, an army ranger when he grew up. And so growing up with an aspiring army ranger across the street meant that we would play war games and we would kind of simulate recon maneuvers for fun in the neighborhood. And even at a young age, two things struck me about my neighborhood friend, Josh. The first was his excitement for entering into chaos, and the second was how he always had a passion for having a strategy regardless of what we were going through. In other words, whenever we would create these warlike, chaotic situations, um, he would always have a stellar strategy. He was aggressive, but graceful. He was purposeful, but patient. And so now whenever I watch a, a modern military movie, you know, focusing in on special ops, SEAL Team 6, American Sniper, uh, 13 Hours, where these uniquely talented and uniquely trained soldiers can go into enemy territory and eliminate the enemies and rescue the hostages by strategically taking a chaotic situation and bringing peace, I immediately think of my childhood friend and neighbor named Josh. But what I also think about, and the reason this is a pertinent opening to my sermon today, is I think about how similar that is to the Christian life. Like, you know, I don't think you have to be a Christian very long before you realize that the pursuit of a relationship with God is done primarily in the context of adversity. In other words, it's a fight. Time and time again, over the course of your life, different seasons, different situations, I think if you're paying attention, you'll find yourself saying, oh, I don't understand it. The good I want to do, I'm not doing. And the evil I want to stop doing, I keep getting pulled into it. And, and so some of you, maybe even tonight on this Father's Day weekend, are discouraged in your Christian life going, Pastor Tim, what's wrong with me? You know, I thought being a Christian would be easier. I thought some of the, the desires and the pulls of my flesh would go away when I got saved, when I followed the Lord in water baptism, when I'd been a Christian for 20 years. I didn't think that it would be this long, this constant of a battle and of a struggle. That may be some of you here tonight. But then I think there's probably others of you who are hearing this opening and you're thinking, yeah, Pastor Tim, I know that the Christian life is a battle. I know it's a struggle. I just, I need a strategy. I need a different strategy in order to help me. Why? Because to this point, Maybe the strategies that you've been trying to employ have just not been working like they used to, or maybe they've never worked. 
And so here's what I want to do with the time that we have together tonight. I don't want to stand up here and give you an emotional, almost like a a high school pep rally, rah-rah emotional sermon where I kind of just fire you up to tell you how you can try harder and be better. I don't want to do that. Rather, really what I want to do is very unemotionally and just honestly lay before you and say, hey, if, if life is a struggle, then let's allow the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God to show us how we can struggle well, how we can struggle well. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider two things. We're going to consider our situation, and then we're going to talk about a strategy. Again, our situation is a battle. The Bible is replete with that language. It's a struggle. It's a fight. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual sources of evil and heavenly places. We, we wrestle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is why 1 John 3, 8 says very explicitly and directly that the reason Jesus, the Son of God, appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, when Jesus came, yes, he came to seek and to save the lost, It was a rescue mission to get the hostages, you and I, out. But he also came to do some heavy lifting of destroying the works of the enemy. And so if you're out there and you're fighting the doubts and you're fighting the troubles, you're fighting addictions or, you know, constant temptation, and you have this idea that you'll never be free, then let me remind you of the good news of the gospel, that the Savior, the hero, the rescuer, His name is Jesus. He has already come to set you free. He's come to fight for you. He's come to give you a future and a hope. Hebrews 2.14 says it this way. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing, speaking of Jesus, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all, say that's me, The all means you and me and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong, what's the last word there? Slavery. Slavery. You are a hostage to sin, to death, to the enemy, to the fear that it brings. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus has come to fight for you. And the empty tomb is the evidence that the war is won. However, and here's where we get a little confused at times. The totality of the rescue mission is still ongoing. To to put it another way, Jesus didn't die on the cross, resurrect from the grave to free us from the fight. Rather, Jesus freed us for the fight. Let me explain it this way. Um, My senior year of high school, a movie came out called Master and Commander, starring Russell Crowe. And it was kind of a spin on a, on a true story about Captain Jack Aubrey, who was charged with taking out Napoleon's great frigate. At, and at the end of the movie, uh, Captain Jack Aubrey comes alongside Napoleon's ship. He disables the main mast. He boards the ship. He fights his way down into the hull. And there, in the bottom of the ship, all these English sailors are being held captive. And so in this climactic moment of the film, Captain Jack Aubrey is breaking chains and he's opening up cages and he's setting these captives free, but as they come out from their captivity onto the deck of the ship, what does he do? He hands them a sword. Why? Because the war may be over. That might have been the clinching battle, but the fight was still ongoing. The war was over. The fight was not over. Well, the the Bible, in a lot of ways, presents you and I, the Christian life, in the same way. That when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you become a child of God, when you are saved, Jesus breaks the chains, he sets you free, and then essentially he hands you a sword and says, before you were just a victim. But now you have a chance to be a victor. I didn't just free you from the fight. I freed you for the fight. So now, child of God, you need to learn how to fight and how to struggle well. Therefore, the Christian life really could be summarized as one movement with two parts. One movement with two parts. It's a movement away and it's a movement toward. 
It's a movement away from certain ways of thinking and living that isolate us from the relationship with God that Jesus Christ purchased for us through the cross. But it's also a movement towards ways of thinking and ways of living that really promote the relationship with God that you and I were made for. This is why the old theologians would break down sanctification in two parts, right? There's mortification and then there's vivification, In other words, there's parts of my life now that I'm a Christian, now that I've made Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior, now that I've been brought into the family of God, there's parts of my life that now I must kill. I must mortify. I don't want those things in my life anymore. I want to squeeze the life out of them. But then there's other things in my life now that I'm a child of God that maybe before I wasn't doing this, but now I am, which is I'm feeding them. I'm vivifying them. There's things now in my life as a child of God that need to flourish within me, hence why you're in church tonight. You're wanting that relationship with God, the word of God, your faith in God to grow, so you're feeding it, you're moving toward it, you're vivifying it. Paul explained it this way to young Timothy. He said, Timothy, you need to flee youthful lusts, and you need to pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace. The same advice is true for you and I tonight. As Christians, the fight looks like this. The dance looks like this. We flee certain things and we pursue certain things. We move away and we move towards. We mortify and we vivify. That's the Christian life. It's a fight and it's a fight for what we could call unrestrained intimacy and relationship with God. Okay, so with that as the foundation, let's look at what the enemy is doing, then let's analyze what we do. In other words, let's have a strategy. And James is going to help us with that. So if we have an enemy, and we do, what is the enemy's goal? To boil it down, the enemy's goal is to get you to sin, to get you to rebel against God. His goal is to get you to take a willful step away from the relationship with God that you were made to have. So the the real question becomes, well, how does the enemy do that? Like, why would anyone who's been saved from eternal death and destruction, why would anyone want to take a destructive, suicidal step away from their creator, their, their sustainer, their, their God? Why would anyone want to do that? The answer is important. And the answer is because the enemy has convinced you of something and made that step away attractive. In other words, the reason any of us take these destructive, almost suicidal steps away from God is because the enemy has solicited thoughts to your mind which stir the affections of your heart. And when you enact the will, what you do is you move in the direction the enemy wants you to go, which is always away from the author of life and toward a vain pursuit of life. You see, the enemy knows a few things about you been around a long time, he's been around uh, before creation of, of mankind, he knows human nature, he knows you, he knows that you have a mind, a cognitive process, he knows that you have affections, inclinations and disinclinations toward and away from, from certain things. The enemy knows that you have a will, a decision-making mechanism, and therefore the enemy knows ultimately that what you think about is what you care about. And what you care about is what you'll pursue. And so the enemy will solicit thoughts to your mind in hopes of appealing to the affections of your heart. The Bible calls that temptation. And that's what Pastor James is talking about to the early church and to you and I here in the latter part of chapter 1. Notice verse 14. James 1 verse 14. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. Lured is the mind's mind's attention. We could say enticed is the heart's affection. And he says, each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. So here's the reality. What, What James is saying is this is coming for all of us. This isn't unique to some Christians and not to other Christians. What's unique is the enemy knows what lures you and what entices you. It's your own desires. 
My desires might not be the same desires as you. What lures me may not, may not lure and entice you. Which means some of the, the best self-awareness that we as the people of God can have is to know how does the enemy lure me. We're really good about knowing what lures other people in church, but do we know how the enemy lures me? Let me ask you this. Do we have any fishermen in the house of God tonight? Anyone want to raise their hand? I know we live in the desert. I think, you, I think it has to do with water. Um, <laughs> no fishermen. I didn't... You, Put them up so I can, okay, God bless that hand. There's two, three hands. All right, four hands. Five, Bruce. All right, brother, thank you. That might have been a sympathy hand. But anyway, uh, let me ask you this. What do you do with the lure? I mean, that's the, the language James uses. What do you do with the lure? You use a lure to what? To get the fish's attention. But a good fisherman knows that you don't simply want to get the fish's attention. What you really want to do is stir his affections. So what do you do? You offer him something that will attract him. You'll offer that fish something that will appeal to him. So so maybe the lure, and I brought some props today, maybe it looks like this. This is a a little worm. It's a fake worm. It's a rubber worm, but it's a worm that is used by fishermen to attract fish. So you might use a worm. It looks all like juicy and wounded and delicious Why? Because your goal is to not only get the fish's attention, but to appeal to his affections. In other words, you want that fish to be swimming around with the school of his other buddies in the the body of water going, yeah, so like I was saying, woo, worm, you know, hello, Mr. Worm, and he goes for it, and you got him. So once his affections are stirred, when he enacts his will and bites the hook, you got him. And he never saw the hook. He never realized that there was a sentient mind behind it. And yet some fish may look at that lure and go, a worm? Really? That's gross. Ew. How lame of you to be attracted to a worm. Like, I don't even know how you can call yourself a fish and be into that. That's fine. The enemy will just come at you with something totally different. And you'll be like, "Woo, shiny, fancy, and off you go. That's why James says each person is tempted when he or she is lured and enticed, get that last part, by his own desire, by what attracts him, by what attracts her, by what appeals to them. So so again, Christian, some of the best self-awareness that you can have is to know how does the enemy lure me? What temptations am I drawn to? What lures and entices me to rebel against God, to take that willful step away from God? What lures and entices me to sin against my God? In his famous book, The Art of War, Sun Tzu says, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, then you need not fear the result of a thousand battles. But if you know neither your enemy nor yourself, then you will succumb to every battle. I don't know if you realize it or not, but that's God's truth. That is truth. And that's what we're doing today. That's what Pastor James is preaching at us today. We're learning our enemy, and we are subsequently learning about ourselves. So now that we know what the enemy does, let's finish by talking about what we do. In other words, if that's the situation... um, then what's our subsequent strategy and response to what the enemy's doing? Let me give you three things. In Matthew 26, 41, James's big brother famously said, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Pay attention to the fact that Jesus didn't say, watch and pray that you don't enter into sin. No, he said, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. In other words, here's how I would define that. If this moment always leads to that moment, then eliminate this moment, right? Eliminate that moment. That's step one. In other words, if if I know the solicitation of thoughts to the mind is stirring the affections of my heart, which leads me to an act of the will, which leads me to a place that I was never meant to be because it's leading me to death and not life, because it's leading me away from God and not toward God, then I don't need to wait and fight the battle here. I need to fight the battle back here. 
So when I was dating my now wife, Leanne, um, we first started dating. I'd met her in church, invited her to my Bible study. Um, during our dating and engagement season, um, <laughs> I knew the temptation to engage in activities that are only holy, beautiful, and proper inside the covenant of marriage. You tracking with me? I knew that they were going to be strongest when we were alone. Shocker. So I'm super awkward. I told her on our second date, I said, hey, I just need to be very upfront with you. Um, I know this is going to sound super weird, and I doubt any other guys told you this, but we can't be alone until we're married. I said, you know, not, I'll spend time with you. We'll spend time together a lot, but it's going to be in public spaces and public settings. We can go to church together. We can go to the movies together. We can go to a restaurant together. We can go to a public setting and square, the mall together, the park together. We can even go back to my house and watch a movie together as long as my roommate is awake, in the living room with us, and basically willing to chaperone us. But we can't go back to your apartment because you live alone. In other words, what I was trying to say to her is that we've got to eliminate this so we don't do this. We tracking? And similarly, I don't know each one of your struggles. I don't know your lure that the enemy uses for you. But if Thirsty Thursday leads to marital fight Friday, then eliminate Thirsty Thursday. If late night loneliness online leads to late night lusting, then eliminate late nights online. If that crew, if that space, if that place, if that situation, if that environment leads to that temptation and that outcome, then eliminate it back here. De declare war on step one. Because some of us willingly talk about our struggle with certain sins and temptations, but if we're being honest, we're not really struggling and fighting all that hard. We're, we're like, no, I can't believe I did that again. <sighs> Take me away. We're not really fighting it. We just kind of know that's our weakness, and then we just keep rolling with the punches. So Jesus is clear. This isn't my advice. This is Jesus' advice. Watch and pray so that you don't enter into temptation. Watch the pattern of temptation in your life. See where the enemy entices you and pray and ask the Holy Spirit of God to show you, to empower you, to illuminate the reality to you and then eliminate this so you don't do that. That's step one, which leads me to point two that James is going to lay out for us. And that is, to put it in my terms, paddle downstream and see where this sin is going to lead. In other words, before I get engage in, in a behavior, let me see where it's going to take me. And, and if I don't want to end up down there, then once again, I'm going to cut it off back here. In other words, Christian, we've got to know where this is going and what this activity in our life is producing. And that's James's point. So he frames it this way in verse 15. He says, Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. What James is saying is, hey, when desire whispers to you, when the lure is initially dropped in the water and you see it, that's not a sin. So far, so good. But when you unite your will with that desire, <sighs> he says she gets pregnant and she has a baby. And that baby's name is sin. But he doesn't stop there. So James paddles downstream. He looks ahead and he says, and sin, that baby, when it's fully grown, it's going to bring forth death. In other words, James is saying, when you sin, you're going to bring forth a death into your life. And I, wow. Like, I mean, wow. Come on, James. Like, why are you using such disturbing imagery and language here? I, I believe that this pastor is wanting to shock you enough to wake you. Because again, when temptation comes, let's be honest, initially it looks good. It, it looks attractive, it looks appealing, it looks enticing. But, but James is revealing to us that it's disguising the fact that there's death downstream. There, there's death on the other side of that hook. Therefore, Christian, you've got to develop the spiritual discipline and muscles to go, no, no, 
Before I jump into bed with desire, what are we going to produce? What is this action in my life going to produce? And do I want that to be true in my life? You know, like for me, to kind of make a light, a light note of this, give you a visual of it, um, in the city I live in, there's really just like one main road, right? Just one, White Sands Boulevard. And on this road, we call it Fast Food Central. Like it's the strip of fast food restaurants. Everything in our town is right there. So when I'm on this road and I'm driving past the fast food restaurants, the ice cream places, the coffee shops, I start salivating <laughs> when I think about a spicy chicken sandwich from Wendy's. Oh, that's my favorite. I get excited when I think about a mint chip milkshake from Baskin Robbins. My hands start like sweating and my lips start sweating when I think about an iced caramel macchiato with almond milk from Starbucks. And though it's not a sin to enjoy one of those treats occasionally, it wouldn't be prudent or healthy for me to indulge in those things daily. So what I've got to do when I drive down the strip of Alamogordo and I drive by those beautiful places is I've got to look downstream. I have to have this conversation with myself where I literally go, look, I know I've got the freedom, the means, and the opportunity to stop at any and all of these places today and every day. But would I rather eat anything and everything or would I rather feel good, to a certain degree look good, and be able to play football with my boys in the backyard? What do I want more? Do I want to run and play with my kids, or do I want to eat whatever, whenever? And, and as, I've, as I've thought about Wendy's through that lens, the drive through has started to look far less alluring and more like an enemy. In fact, sometimes I'll drive by Wendy's and I'll roll down the window and I'll go, not today, Jezebel. You won't keep me from playing catch with my boys anymore, right? Like I can resist that temptation because I can look downstream and see where this is going to lead. And that's kind of a funny way of putting it, but that's what we've got to do. We've got to develop the spiritual strategy and discipline before we engage in a behavior to ask yourself before God. Don't lie to yourself. Don't be deceived. Where is this going to lead? Where is this going to lead if I resist that wise counsel that was given to me? Where is this going to lead if I go to that place? If I order that third drink? If I go on that date? If I respond in that way, if I talk to my spouse in that way, if I utter those words, if I open that app, where is this leading? Where is this going? What is this conceiving and birthing for me down the road? So we've got to look downstream. And then the last thing that James tells us to do is, is almost the exact opposite. We have to look upstream. We have to look upstream. See, if temptation leads to death and destruction, as James says, downstream, then the natural question is, well, then what's giving it the energy to be alluring upstream? Well, in verse 16, James says something that you've heard him say before. He says, do not be deceived, Christian, my beloved brothers. Don't be deceived. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. What James is saying here is, hey, if destruction is downstream from temptation, then the deception starts up there. It, it starts at the top of the stream. So what's the deception? He says, don't be deceived. So here it is. Every good and perfect gift comes down from your father. What James is saying is the lie that births a million sins is the lie that your God is not a good father, is the lie that your God is not a good dad who will take care of you. In other words, Christian, if you have believed the lie, if you don't think that God will meet your needs, if you don't think God cares about your love life, your work life, if you don't think God cares about your family, your finances, your future, if you don't think that God is 
caring about you and looking out for you when you struggle, if you don't believe that he is your ever-present help in time of need, if you don't believe that God cares about you, then you'll go to a million different places to find that happiness and satisfaction. In other words, if the devil can sever you from the love of God, you'll go drink from many other deceptive streams. And that's why James says, hey, you need to fight the battle up here. You need to fight the battle upstream. So I'll be honest with you. I used to, um, as a young man, late teenage, early 20s, I used to really dislike any Christian worship song that was about you know, God's love uh, for us or our love to God. It almost felt like a love song. And I, and I used to wonder, why don't I like these Christian songs about loving God or God loving us? And I thought, maybe it's because I'm a man. I bet the girls like these songs, but as a man, it's just kind of weird talking about God and loving him, you know. Maybe it's too sappy, maybe it's too sentimental, maybe it's too emotional. Is it the style, is it the words, is it the beat of the song? And, and I thought, no, it's, it's really none of those things. And so I came to the conclusion that I just really struggled to believe it. Right, like I really, I intellectually, theologically, I kind of agreed with it, but I struggled to believe that God could really love me that passionately. I know me. How could God love me that powerfully, that deeply, that profoundly? But now, if I'm being honest, I love worship songs. I love them. I love songs about God's love. So what changed for me? Well, I think what changed for me in the terms of maturation is that I became a father myself four times. And with each one of my four kids, from Sadie to Dempsey, Finley, and now baby Brecklin, there are these moments where I just love them so much that I just want to hold them and behold them. I just want to squeeze them. My wife, my Hispanic wife calls it ansias. Oh, you just want to, oh, I just love you. You know, just, oh, I just love my kids, right? I just want to squeeze them and kiss them. And so any parent, I think moms and dads, I think we have all felt the limits of human language. In other words, explaining the love that we have for our children, it's often hard to describe. It's hard to explain. It's hard to put into words. And yet, at the end of the day, as frustrating as they can be, there's this palpable passion that explodes inside of our parental heart that says, I would do anything for you. I love you. I just love you. And so every time I think about this supernatural love that I have for my kids, now the Holy Spirit uses that to remind me of, essentially he's like, hey Tim, do, do you really think that you have a greater capacity to love than me? Good timing. In other words, if we can love our kids that much, the question has to be asked, how much more does God love his children? Children that he purchased with the shed blood of his only son, Jesus. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, wait, wait, Pastor Tim, where did, where did we go away from sin and temptation and strategy and struggle? What, how does this fit into that? Good question. The answer is if you can grasp the love that God has for you, yes, you, then as a good coach would say, the best defense against sin is actually a good offense. It's a good offense. So, so for instance, I'm doing this for John Seymour. How did Romeo get Rosalind? Remember the story of Romeo and Juliet? Romeo, the story begins with him pining away about how beautiful and how matchless and how wonderful his ex-girlfriend Rosalind is. And, and his buddy Benvolio is annoyed by him always talking about her. So Benvolio was like, bro, you got to get over Rosalind. Let me take you to a party where there's a hundred girls prettier and better than her. This is my rendition. But what did Romeo say? He said, the all-seeing sun has ne'er met her match since first the world begun. In other words, no, bro, Rosalind is primo. But the story progresses, and Romeo reluctantly went to the party. And it was there that Romeo met who? Juliet. And that same night, 
he snuck into her yard, he looked up at her window, and he said, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks, it is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, which is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, are far more fair than she. In other words, Rosalind who? I'm over her, right? Pastor Bruce will like this one. The Puritans used to say, how do you dislodge a beautiful thing from the human heart? You replace it with a more beautiful thing. A good defense is a good offense. And so church, I challenge you on this Father's Day weekend with all the emotions the grief, the love that we feel during this time, I challenge you to go on a journey to really know your Father, to know your God. Man, put the screens down, put the distractions down, pick the Word of God up. I challenge you to dive deep into knowing who your Father is, what your Father's like. Why? Because to see Him is to love Him. And to love him is to be more like him. Because when you set your mind on God, the affections of your heart are stirred for him. And when your affections for God have been stirred, you'll chase him. And as you spend your days and your life and your years chasing after God, look out for what God will do in and through your life when you seek first the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word where you tell us that there's no temptation that's overtaken us except that which is common to man, but that you, God, you're the faithful one and you will always provide a way of escape that we can get out from under that enticement, that temptation, that lure, that hook. And Father, I know that over the course of my life, through the ups and downs, through my own uh, sins and struggles and temptations and frustrations, I have watched myself fall in love with Jesus. And I know that the more I love you, the things of this earth, as the old hymn says, they just grow strangely dim in the light of your glory, in the light of your grace, in the light of your love. And Lord, I know that's what you want for every person under the sound of my voice tonight. Because that's where freedom is, to to run in the path of your commands because it's there that you set our hearts free. That's what we want. That's what we need. Continue the work that you've started in us and we know that you're faithful to do it. And all of God's people who agreed said, amen, amen.